you know, I was thinking a lot last night about uh, this, you know, especially as leaders of the church, about what we're, you know, because I felt like maybe sometimes we're trying to force things on people, and that's definitely not what we want to do, you know. Um, but, like, especially with, I know everyone here is already baptized except for Elmer, but, like, um, you know, this should be your number one priority if you don't know right now. Because, um, you know, uh, I think Tozer, this uh, theologian, said that there's, there's no way, like, no one ever receives the Holy Spirit and no one ever receives the power of the Holy Spirit without knowing it, you know? And if you think about that, that's um, a staggering statement. No one ever receives the power of the Holy Spirit without knowing it, okay? So, um, it's definitely something that is challenging, you know? How do you know that you have the Holy Spirit? How do you know? Do you, um, when you, as you live out your, your, your life on a daily basis, are you living it by the power of the Holy Spirit? Um, do you guys remember, uh, let's actually go there, John chapter 3, verse 3, and we'll read to verse 10. Okay, um, Simeta, can you read the passage for us John 3 3 to 10 John 3 through the 10 yes he just replied very true very truly I tell you no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again how can someone be born when they are old Nicodemus asked surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born Jesus answered very truly I tell you no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit flesh gives birth to reflect Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Okay, so... Uh, you know, I'm, we've read this like countless times before, and Jesus is telling Nicodemus, right, that unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, very clear. And then he makes this other statement that which is, I like the way Meta's version says it. Mine says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Her says, the flesh gives birth to flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Her says, the spirit gives birth to spirit. Okay? And uh, he says, don't marvel that I say this to you. You must be born again. And we must be born by the spirit. Like, the Holy Spirit has to give birth in us of his spirit that is what it means to be born again right it is a it's a supernatural miraculous thing that happens when somebody is born again it's it's not a choice that a person makes a person can't choose to be born again it is something the spirit of god does it is a spirit who gives birth to the spirit now, and the last thing I wanted to point out about this passage is verse, uh, how does Nicodemus react? He says, how can these things be? How is this possible? Like, like, he was shocked when Jesus told him that. And Jesus re uh, responded, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Like, what's Jesus saying by that? When he says that, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Did Jesus expect Nicodemus to have understood these things? Yeah. He did. How, how would 
Jesus, how would Nicodemus have understood the truth that unless a person had been born again, they would not see the kingdom of God? So that's kind of what I wanted to go into. Because obviously, Jesus didn't think he was saying anything new to Nicodemus. He expected, as the teacher of Israel, he expected Nicodemus to have at least some sort of impression or idea or concept of being born again. Okay, so, um, let's go to Numbers 27, 18. And the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun with you, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hands on him, set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and inaugurate him in their sight. And you shall give some of your authority to him, that all the congregation of the, the children of Israel may be obedient. Um, the reason I want to read this verse is because it shows that Joshua, you know, uh, Moses' right-hand man, was filled with the Spirit of God. You know, so it's not something, it's not a strange concept to talk, to, to talk about having the Spirit of God in you, the life of the Spirit. That's, you know, um, that is what um, the new man is. You know, how, how Paul talks about the new man, the new life. It's the life of the Spirit in us. It's the life of God. That's, that's what means being born again. Um, let's see another example. Yeah, just to give you the background, this is when Samuel meets with Saul and basically is ready to anoint Saul as the king of Israel, right? So, 1 Samuel 10, 5, it says, After that you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you have come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them. And they will be prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. You shall surely go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. So it was when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, that God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. When they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets, that the people said to one another, What is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Right? This is an incredible illustration of how the Spirit works. Right? And uh, I can't, you know, I'm not going to say that he works the same way every single time. But here I think it is a clear example of when somebody gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? They know in their hearts they're a new person. You know it in your heart that God has done something miraculous inside you. Right? It is a grace of it is by the grace of God that people are born again. You know? And um, so how is all of this related to the subject of gifts, right? Because, um, you know, I, I do kind of sense, you know, um, uh, it's just a, a weird, I don't know what it is, you know, 
just people not really caring. Do you guys care? Do you guys care whether or not you have a gift or not? Do you guys care whether you have been born again? Is it something you think about? Like, I, I know, I speak to the ones that, are, that have been baptized already. Has God actually done something inside you that you know for sure that nobody else can deny? Because you know it in your heart. Right? That is what we're talking about here. Because it is pointless for us to talk to you guys about the gifts of the Spirit when you're not even born again. It's pointless. And you guys, to you, this will be like, we might as well be talking Martian. We might as well be talking some, you know, just nonsense. Right? So that's, I wanted to stress that point. <coughs> you, you have to be born again. And if you're not born again, then you have bigger problems than not knowing what your gift is. Okay? So that's why Tozer says, No one ever received the Holy Spirit's power without knowing it. And it is unwise to convince someone that they've been filled with the Spirit if there's no evidence for it in their life. Now, I'm not going to try and convince you that you, you have a gift when there's no evidence for it in your life. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. And, and question. And yes. being baptized doesn't necessarily mean being born again, right? So, in the, yeah, that's I know that question always. Uh, like in Ali's class the other day, um, it was funny because they kind of turned into this like shouting match. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, people have this idea that um, being born <laughs> again means just going through this act of being baptized. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, I don't think that way, you know. Um, I think being baptized, somebody who gets back, only people who know God has already done something in their hearts should get baptized. I think that should be the teaching of the church. Um, unfortunately, I think the main teaching is that um, you get baptized to be saved, right? Either that or you get baptized when you feel like you can fully commit. Mm -hmm. Or you get baptized so that, um, because that will turn your life around, you know? So there's a strong, there's a strong connection made in many churches between baptism and being born again. That's all. It's one and the same. It's the same thing happening, you know. And unfortunately, that's, I don't believe that that's what the Bible teaches. Being born again is a supernatural thing. The Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. And, you know, we could read um, a ton of other verses that makes it clear that it is not by the will of man, but it is by the will of God when people are born again. Um, <clears throat> Alright, so let's move on to the gifts. Um, do you guys know what uh, the spiritual gifts, or how should I say this? Uh, what is, have you guys been over the Greek word for the spiritual gifts? What's the Greek word for gifts? You guys know? Okay. <laughs> so, um, the word for, let me start with grace. The word for grace is... Uh, Caris. Okay? So when we say that we are uh, saved by grace, in Greek it's by the caris of God. Okay? Uh, a gift of grace, or, a, or just simply what we call spiritual gifts, but technically it's called, it is a, a gracious gift, is charisma. Related to the word caris, mm -hmm. from caris we get charisma. It is a, it is a gracious gift. <clears throat> it is like a favor that is given to you, something that is handed over. Charisma, and and uh, obviously you guys have heard heard of the word charisma, right? Mm -hmm. um, because people use it now 
uh, to describe something that, uh, like when somebody has charisma, what, what are you saying if somebody has charisma? They're likable. Likable, right? There's something special about them. You know, they... And that's how, um, that's how pagans used to use the word charisma. Um, when somebody had charm or beauty or creativity or fertility, they would call that <coughs> charisma. And they believed that it was something given to someone by the gods. You know, the gods had given such a person like uh, great strength or courage. You know, just a lot of just natural stuff. Okay, so when we speak of um, the gifts of the Spirit, we're, st we're talking about charisma. And plural is charismata. Um, okay, now it is possible, at least it's implied here, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. It says, Let no one despise your youth. But be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. 14. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Okay, so when Paul says this, he is obviously implying that a gift, a charisma, a gracious gift given to you can be neglected. Which is why he admonished Timothy, do not neglect. Um, obviously, um, how can you not neglect if you don't know what it is? Do, do any of you guys feel any closer to knowing what your gift is than like a month ago? No? Okay. <laughs> well, we'll keep going. I mean, I don't know how long the series is going to be. Uh, you know, and I, I'm sure we might get tired of hearing about gifts this and gifts that. But, you know, it's even if we end the series, like... Um, you know, this should be a, a heavy matter in your hearts. You know, this is about, uh, like I said, this is about the purpose of why you even live. Why do you even live? You know, what is, what is the purpose that you live for? You know, what is your role in the body? You're a member of the body of Christ. How are you going to, are you, an, you know, a joint are you an organ? Are you, you know, what is your role in the church? And you know, it, is, it is what will give you the utmost joy to do. When you exercise your gift, you know, you know that you have found your purpose. And that's huge. A lot of people live life without that, a meaning, without meaning in their lives. Right? And, and they go after so many other things because they're looking for their meaning. They think it, it's money, women, power, all of that. And, and then they get all of that and they understand there's no meaning in any, any of it. And this is about the meaning of your life. You know, so you know, I can't stress enough to you guys, if you don't know your gift... Uh, oh, actually, I read, this, I read this last night and I thought it was really good. What is the one what is the one way to definitively find out what your gift is? Who can tell you what your gift is a hundred percent for sure? Who is it? God? Yes! It's God. <laughs> right? If you don't know what your gift is, God can tell you. The Holy Spirit can make it clear to you what your gift is. And how, so how are you going to find out from Him? You ask. You pray.
Okay, prayer, 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 and you know, if nothing else, uh, for for you guys that are still unsure of what your gift is, that is what my number one recommendation to you is: is pray, 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 pray until God makes it clear to you what He wants you to do, what your gift is. You know. Um, and I think, so that actually brings me to my last point, so we're probably going to end a little early. Because <clears throat> um, at the end of the day, right, the church is um, what the Bible calls the body of Christ, okay? And uh, the body is, you know, it's a living thing, it's organic, right? It... Um, the Bible calls the church the body of Christ and and Christ being the head of the church, right? Just like a body, right? So we are his hands and his feet. And I was thinking like last night, you know, like I do what I want with my body, you know, like my head, if I want to raise my hand, I raise my hand. If I want to step with my left foot, I step with my left foot, you know, my brain tells the rest of my body what to do according to my will. So Christ is the head of the body, right? So the body moves according to His will. And so at the end of the day, it's, it's about what God, what Christ wants to accomplish. It's His plan. It's, um, we are His people, His servants. We are joined to Him in this holy union. And so when He wants to get something done, He will use us. He will use me and you, and He'll move us by the Spirit to do what He wants us to do. So, you know, which is why it's crucial that you be indeed joined in that holy communion in that holy union with Christ, uh, you know, being part of the vine, so to speak. And you will want to serve. Okay, you will want, when, uh, when you recognize that God is moving, like, uh, you will want to not, you know, as a child of God, you want to be part of it. You, there's, no, um, there's no way that you don't want to be part of what you see is clearly God's work. So this is uh, God's agenda. Um, the church is a living, breathing, e eternal organism. And we are, as a church, we are the body of Christ. And um, so basically, you know, it's, it is about His will ultimately. But it's, it's about making sure that we are actually indeed members of His body. And just as uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about how in our body we have different members that do different things. We have knee joints, shoulders, we have ankles, we have feet, we have, you know, whatever else. The church has many kinds of members. And we're all working and fitting together for the ultimate purpose of accomplishing what God wants us to accomplish. And for us, it happens to be in this community. You know, this is where God has placed us. This is where, you know, He wants us to do something here. And, you know, hopefully with uh, Elmer's leadership, pastorship, and the teachers, and the leaders, and the ministries, you know, we can all begin to, to exercise all the gifts that God has given this church. And, you know, then and only then are we going to make the impact that, that we want to make, that we want to see, the changes that we want to see, you know, expanding God's kingdom. Okay, that's all I have for you guys. So, yes, any questions or comments or... No? Okay. Have you identified your gift? Yes. I believe it's teaching and some are preaching. Yeah. Um, and actually, another gift that I believe God has 
I re that revealed to me like uh, I don't know. I think it was like 20 years ago. It was it was something uh, you know. It's something that was not nobody said anything to me, but it was just something. I just heard something. Uh, I had this job of building windows, and uh, and I was put next to this really vet veteran guy who like super expert at what he was doing and um, they they sent me to go help him and as I was helping him um, he said hey you're a really good helper mm. and just then something something into my mind said that I was going to be a good right hand person mm. somebody mm. alongside mm. and ever since then that thought has stuck out to me mm -hmm. and I've actually noticed that in both in many scenarios even at work uh, like at my boss, he's like, he's a uh, Taiwanese guy, mm -hmm. tall, like over six feet Chinese guy. He's a genius. He's a straight up genius. And he's good at what he does. Um, and like I've become his like right hand man, you know. And, uh, and I've just, I don't know, I've seen it play out with just other scenarios. You know, uh, with this church in particular, I'm going to try to be... You know, whoever is right hand, whether it's Elmer's or somebody else, right hand man. Mm -hmm. You know, I can serve in any way that I can. Mm -hmm. So that's another kind of gift that I feel like God has given me. So if the Holy Spirit will speak to you. You know, but it does take that right attitude. It, it takes an ex. You know, uh, uh, exactly. Yes. Okay. Let's start. Uh, let's pray.